Uh, Miigwech. Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, I'm quite pleased to be back in Walpole Island. It has been a number of years. Um, Alan is quite a hard act to follow, so I'm not sure I'll be as humorous or as entertaining as Alan. Um, my paper is more about how, after the war, uh, the Canadian and American governments began and, and undermine Tecumseh's vision from the first hundred or so years, even though we all know they continue to try to do this, um, through the various mythologies created in official histories. And I'm also going to specifically talk about uh, Sault Ste. Marie, or Bowating, Garden River, Batchewana, Sioux Tribe, and Bain Mills. Um, I'm also not going to read to you, I'm just kind of following my notes. So. Throughout, once the war was over, uh, a number of our people, I hate microphones, uh, a number of our people returned, Shinawak on Sasaba, one of my relatives, John Bell, uh, returned and hoped to found and remake their lives in Sault Ste. Marie. They returned to a village that was burned. American military came up and burned most of the town, um, other than a couple houses. Um, and they had to remake their lives or at least restart. And one of the first things that happened in the area was a re-exertion by the colonial authorities to try to remake, retake, and establish their presence. The first to do this was the Americans in 1815 and 1816. And they come up to the Sioux, went across up into Lake Superior in an effort to exert American authority, and they were fired upon by unknown assailants. Uh, supposedly their canoes were peppered with buckshot and uh, musket fire. And this is, you know, right, as, um, you know, as Alan, as Alan, sorry, it's in the documentary record. And there, you know, I, I always connected to a story of a, uh, my great, great grandmother who used to greet ships as they crossed from Bell's Point coming up the canal many, many years later. She'd take out the um, old John's old musket and fire in honor of meeting the ships. And it was always kept loaded for the first ship of the spring. And the lady, because the men were out in the field working, she grabbed the musket, ran out, and fired it, failing to note that it had been previously fired. And the ship captain reported buckshot bouncing off his cabin. <laughs> I kind of wonder if she, you know, these other people were just greeting the Americans as we were traditionally greeting the first ship of the year, which also happened to be flying the American flag. Um, the Americans quickly left the area and only returned in 1820 with a strong military force when Warhawk and General um, uh, Warhawk and Michigan Territorial Governor Lewis Cass, who was at the surrender of Detroit, um, was more than willing to um, forcefully take Sault Ste. Marie should the Anishinaabe prove resistant to American demands for a treaty. Thankfully, despite Cass's aggression, and poor behavior. People in the region, um, the women convinced the warriors and Shinwalk wants to step forward and speak to the more, um, I shall say, hotheads in the community, not to start a fight, but to peacefully um, sign a treaty and deal with these new companies, returning of these individuals. The treaty was signed, the Americans gained the right to build a fort at the rapids while we protected our, fish our fisheries as well as the graves of our ancestors. Two years later, the American military showed up to build a military garrison. Um, first was about 273 men, and they retained this fort for many, many years. It's now the University of Lake, it's Lake, State Superior, uh, Lake Superior State University now. The thing is, is a lot of scholars see this building of this fort in Sioux, Michigan as the expression of American dominance in the region. It means that, you know, it's the end of the border, it's, you know, it's beyond the frontier, it's behind the frontier, etc., etc. I can tell they don't actually read the documents or talk to anybody, because the American military did not leave beyond their musket shot or bullet range of the fort's walls. If they did, they went out in a number of men. They did not venture very far, and when they did, they met hostility. Um, if not aggression, but not, not no violence. Indian agents were also subsequently appointed. The first was Henry Schoolcraft, 
founder, one of the founders of American ethnology and anthropology. Um, there, he was essentially appointed to convince the Anishinaabe to remain loyal or become loyal to the United States to enforce American policies, offer gifts, and so on. And the British quickly followed. Um, Schoolcraft became, was appointed in um, 1822. And the uh, British Canadians appointed somebody in 1832 by the name of McMurray. Now, William McMurray is also the Anglican missionary. And the interesting thing about Schoolcraft and McMurray, as Britain and Canada, Britain, Canada and the United Americans try to create this you know, their spheres of influence in the region, is McMurray and Schoolcraft marry sisters. Right, so they're connected. This is the fun thing about the borders. They are connected. They're both there to establish loyalty to the United States and to Canada. McMurray, for on many occasions, because his wife, um, through her pregnancies and other things, wanted to return to her mother, who lived in Sioux, Michigan, he regularly resided in the American Indian agent's house. And I have stories of him presenting gifts of the great of the great father, and promoting British loyalty in one end of the American Indian house, while Jane, while Henry Schoolcraft at the other end is saying, "Be loyal to the president, and here's your American flag." Yeah, so I have you know Shinwalk literally would just walk down the hall and collect gifts from both people, and this went on for until McMurray left um, a number of years later. And this is just, you know, this is an attempt, and both policies, I say, were the same. The American government, through schoolcraft, agricultural implements, blacksmith services, and so forth. McMurray, farm implements, blacksmith services, and so the same thing. All about keeping the Anishinaabe peaceful and trying to get us to be loyal to either side. While these men are undertaking these activities, there's a whole series of treaties signed in the region. Um, I know Phil's going to talk about some of it. But from those 1820, 26, 36, 1842, 50, 1855, and 1859. Now those are those are American and Canadian treaties. I lumped them together because they had the exact same effect. Is they took millions of acres of land, control of resources were assumed by the by the British, Canadian, and American governments, and we were displaced from our lands. Force, forced to remain on reserves, although less force in the beginning, but more as time goes on. And basically, a vast mineral store passed to the hands of the newcomers and denied us the ability to enjoy our revenues that would have been derived from this. And a good example is, is Chief Shinlock, founder of Garden River there, he says, in 1849 and talking about getting a proper treaty done for Canada, he says, we have the example of our brethren upon the other side of the lake to guide us in our transactions. They have sold all of their lands and they can only behold but not share in the wealth which their lands produce. Unfortunately, after signing the 1850 treaty, Shinwalk soon found out that we too would have to watch our lands and the resources be exploited and not share in the wealth which they produced. This was done through a number of denials of our rights and minerals, everything through the annuity. And, um, the 1850 treaties have this funky little thing called an escalator clause, whereby if the government revenues from resources hit a certain amount of money, we're supposed to have our annuities increased. Well, in 1867, the province of Ontario gets a hold of the resources as its right, and Canada, the federal government, gets Indians. So to increase the revenues, Ontario has to transfer money to the federal government to then, for them to then increase our annuities. Like, that's going to happen. Also speaking in collusion between the federal and provincial governments is the Natural Resource Transfer Act of 1924, which allowed um, or gave Ontario the right to 50% to or 100% of all mineral royalties generated on reserves. So even if we wanted to exploit our own resources, we'd have to pay half or more of the revenues back to the province. 
I never remember. Every time I read the treaty, I fail to see them gaining authority on our reserves within that treaty. Other Indian Act laws, you know, all gave the Department of Indian Affairs great power to do this. Other land issues that helped fare poorly in the region is in 1855, there's a treaty in Sioux, Michigan, which in a way terminates an artificial tribal structure created by Henry Schoolcraft about 20 years earlier, 1836, in an effort to sign a treaty back in 1836. And the termination of this tribal structure was meant to terminate the artificial, artificial creation of the Odawa Ojibwa government. And what happens is the American authorities, um, from my understanding, interpret it to mean that all tribal structures are now terminated and there is no tribal government, so to speak. Yeah, it's like, presto, you don't exist. Um, it also dissolved the land base. Under the terms, uh, the Anishinaabe could select various reserved lands within the American side, on the American side of the river, but through corruption, settlers got a hold of the lands that were supposed to be set aside. Um, Anishinaabe deeds were not, in, were not issued for many, many years. Um, up until the 1920s, people still didn't have their certificates to title of land, thereby dispossessing the, Métis, uh, the First Nations on that side of all the, everything. Um, I'm not going to get into the Métis. But the one that I really would really like to share, too, is this idea of borderland identity. The Canadian and American governments, as we know, have, have a... Um, nifty idea that they can define who we are, right? The United States, if you're 50% Indian, you're a federal recognized member, otherwise there's a various set of rules to be recognized by different tribes, bands, or states. And in Canada, it all depended on who you married, right? Who you married or didn't marry. Um, still does today. And these policies, well different, have the same effect. It's much like, as I would like to call it, erasure. An attempt to erase their responsibilities to us as created through treaties and other agreements over time, and even within their own legal frameworks. And all of this was the idea of, simil um, was essentially, like I say, to eliminate us to get a hold of the land. One of the interesting things of these confluence of the borders is Canadian status laws. You know, if you uh, before '85, you know, as you know, you marry out, you're gone. Well, as American Indian removals taking place in the United States, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Iroquois and um, Haudenosaunee people are moving up into Upper Canada. And there's even a little bit of movement into Quebec, I've been told recently. Um, and these people are not seen as Indians in Canada. So if you're um, in a lot of Potawatomi, I know settled here and settled up along all the way up to the bottom of Lake Huron. They also some also came up to Garden River, and there's a couple cases at Garden, and I know there's cases along here as well where Canadian Indians, as in somebody who resides in Canada, marries an American Indian or a refugee, and they're immediately decided as no longer worthy of receiving annuities and are removed from the band rolls despite having married another Indian, because you didn't marry an Indian. Whereas in the United States, these people qualify as 50%, so if they moved home, as in the Potawatomi male moved back to the United States with his new wife, they would be federally recognized Indians. This is incredible to me, insanity that's created after the War of 1812 in an effort to eliminate us. It has led to weird definitions of membership and identity in all of our communities, amongst all of our people. The Métis have, odd, have some odd membership rules, thanks to a Supreme Court decision and their own interpretations of it. My reserve, Garden River, is trying to undergo, um, again, another debate on membership and how to define membership, whether it be on blood, Modified Indian Act rules or custom. Okay. 
but yet nobody defines what custom is because we need to have a meeting over this, but nobody wants to have a meeting because it's too divisive, and as I like to say, and around and around the merry-go we go. Um, I'm hoping we actually have a meeting because I really would like to take part in this because I'm very interested in how and why what we're doing. Um, I just got a notification, and I'm not even going to get the fun stuff, um, is from the imposition of these, Ameri these Indian agents from 1822 up through um, 1891, is the governments of the United States and Canada like to mess with our leadership. Nem Negojing is appointed chief of the Ojibwa of the Great Lakes after his dad dies in the war. 1835, William McMurray erects Shinlockholtz as the head chief of all the Ojibwa over Neb Negojing. And this is because Neb Negojing refused to relocate to the British shore, supposedly was a smuggler and or connected to smugglers. In other words, he respected the Jay Treaty. He remained a Roman Catholic, if you remember McMurray's an Anglican, and Anglicans do not like Catholics at this time period. And Neb Negojing at this time in 1835 was a very big supporter of Métis rights to the region. Um, generally, Shinwalk is seen as the main leader from 1850 up until his death in 1854. And I want to make it clear, I'm not contesting the man's leadership. He was a very good leader. He was very brilliant. This is just how the governments like to try and influence our leadership. Um, after Shinwalk owns his death, it passed to his two sons, Augusta and Bogo Janini. And Shinwalk, it's, it's in the record, and I've been ta ta um, told about this by Betty Grabarger, is that Shinwalk once passed his medals, the symbols of British, you know, his medals, some of his wampum, and some other art uh, items connected to his leadership to his two sons, Augusta and Bogo Janini. He divided it equally. So he meant for both boys to be the new leaders, because they each had special skills. And Despite this, the government, as always, wants one man to deal with. And they decided it would be Augusta. However, the Reverend James Chance, the new Anglican missionary, didn't like Augusta. He was more friends with Bogowicz Nini. And on three separate occasions, he attempted to have Augusta removed for various reasons, including ties to the Catholic Church, although Augusta was never a member, smuggling, drinking, um, financial irregularities and various other accusations that were never actually proven. And were from uh, my, my interest and my looking at it, some of the financial irregularities go back to Reverend James Chance. Um, nothing like blaming somebody else for your own uh, impositions. And finally at Garden River, the real imposition of government came in 1891 um, when Augusta died. That same year, the Indian agent um, who was on the reserve, uh, decided that we were going to have elections. And since that date, we've had elections under Indian Affairs rules. Something else we're supposed to be having meetings to try and get out from. We just had an election. Um, and these elections have been with us ever since. And when you look at the records, and when you see what goes on today, these elections aren't any good for our communities. They're just too damn divisive. This first past the post is horrible. Um, and we need to fix this problem. And you know, it goes back to the government trying to control and interfere our leadership and hopefully getting what they want. Fortunately, many of our leaders, since their first elected leader in 1891, has opposed this, um, and I continue to laud them and uh, encourage them to do so. Finally, you know, just to, by way of summary, is that, you know, these are just a couple of the highlights of what went on. And there's so many other things the government's tried to do, impo besides imposing identities and messing with leadership and taking land, taking our land bases. You know, they view us differently under their courts and legal doctrines. They tried to re-educate us through forced through forced re-education. I can't call it anything else. They created what you can call loosely re-education camps centered around buildings called residential schools. The Shinwalk home, Wawanosh homes, and Sault Ste. Marie are two prime examples. But not only that, many people are forgetting about the day schools run by the churches and the governments on the reserve. They too had negative effects in our communities. They too promoted um, 
the main dominant languages, dominant Western views of our world, our heavens, and our earth and waters. And what's, and what's as bad is equally at poor educational levels upon our children. And I can go on, but I really don't want to depress people. This is more about the idea the government tried to mess with us, but many of our leaders, many of them unnamed, and I will name some, Oshuan, Oshinwak, and Sedem de Gojing in Augusta in the 19th century. You have Tom Tebow, Amable Buz Buzno in the early 20th, Frank Teepley, Norman Cameron from the American side in the early 20th, as well as many modern leaders um, that are continuing to fight and demand that Tecumseh's vision of us sharing our lands and being treated with equality and our sovereignty be respected. So, thank you.